Has anybody ever used a microscope? Yeah, remember that? I remember eighth grade biology class using a microscope. Uh, Mr. Bishop was my teacher. And uh, the thing that I remember about using a microscope is um, it was a little bit frustrating because we had to um, look in the microscope at a specific thing, little microorganism, do drawings and take notes and so forth. But the problem is stuff was moving around and uh, the viewport was really narrow and it was just really hard to see. So I spent all my time just kind of moving the thing around to see where, where the heck the thing was. And I couldn't really get a sense for the size of it or, or anything. It's a little bit frustrating. Um, I've noticed that work is kind of like that. It's kind of like Mr. Bishop's eighth grade biology class where my viewport is often pretty narrow and I can't see everything that's happening inside the organization and I can't see how it all fits together. And sometimes I can't even see like the problems, some of the problems that we have that I feel the symptoms of, but I don't necessarily know how to address it. And that leaves me feeling, you know, a little um, uh, disenfranchised, disempowered, unhappy in my work. Um, I certainly felt that for a long time when I was leading teams at, at MailChimp where I knew there were things that we could be doing better, but I just didn't know what. I was living life inside of a microscope, but these days I've got uh, kind of a weird role at Envision. Um, I lead this team called Design Education, and my job is to look through a telescope. No, no, no more microscopes, all telescopes now to see the big picture. And so we look at a lot of different types of teams at a lot of different types of companies. Um, you know, some are banks, some are insurance companies, they're entertainment, tech companies, et cetera government agencies sometimes. Um, yesterday, if you were here, you probably heard Kevin mention that big study that uh, Leah Bewley on my team did, um, studying 2,200 different companies around the world to see how they work and what leads to success. That's a telescope, right? That's a big telescope. You can see a lot of the constellations. Um, what's interesting uh, is that uh, the challenges that I faced when I was a design leader and as an individual contributor as well, they weren't just our problems, they weren't specific to us. Turns out everybody has the same problem. So if you're thinking, man, if only we had more headcount, if only we had more resources, more budget, whatever, the grass would be greener. Turns out the grass is not greener anywhere, so you can, you can put that in the bank. Nobody has it figured out. And there are common breakpoints, things that we see as we study lots of different companies and, and look at these teams. Things that lead to success, I want to try to give you some of that so you can walk away with that and put that to work uh, on Monday. Um, and also some, some challenges as well. And just seeing those, knowing that that's just typical to, to you know, the state of work, and seeing a way forward is really key. So I've seen that the breakpoint often boils down to people stuff. And we focus a lot on craft and how we do things. That's good. Uh, we get a lot of satisfaction from that. I do certainly, but it turns out when you have mo people, you got mo problems. Um, everything resolves back to people problems, and let me, let me just show you why that is. I drew a little diagram for you. Um, if you have a team of three people, you have three lines of communication. If you have a team of four people, you have six lines of communication. I'm going to fast forward here. If you have six people, now you've got 15 lines of communication. You get all the way up to a 14-person team. Raise your hand if you have 14 people in your team. Okay, so there's a fair number of us, maybe 25%. That means you people have 91 lines of communication just inside of your team. That's just inside of your team, and that's not the other teams you have to work with. Uh, maybe engineering or product or maybe marketing or sales or executives, etc. So it's all exponential, and it just creates such complexity. And if we can't talk well about our work, and if we can't um, you know, talk to other people about what we do, it's really hard to be productive. It's really hard to do good, satisfying work. And to go home at the end of the day and feel like, you know, I'm glad I got up this morning. I'm glad, I, I'm, glad I'm doing this, this job. So language, language is important. Words are very important. And the words that we choose to use to talk about our work and how we talk to others about our work is really important. Um, 
what I've noticed is that as teams grow, um, there's a ton of investment in design teams lately. Uh, I've seen insurance companies that now have like 150 designers. Google, I just talked to Catherine Courage, who's VP of, of UX there. Uh, she told me that they have 3,600 designers at Google now. IBM has 2,200 plus. Um, so the fact that I'm, you know, we're seeing lots of big, big design teams says a lot. That's why yesterday Kevin was talking about design operations. That's why we need is because we're getting bigger teams. And when we get bigger teams, we start to get more specialization. It used to be that, oh, we're all designers, so let's talk about design. Now there's UI, and there's UX, and there's research, and you know, various other things. Everyone's got their specific language that helps them dial in their work more effectively. And then we add layers of that. Like we have to talk to engineers, and there are not just one type of engineer, lots of different types of engineers, et cetera, et cetera. So language starts to fragment to the point where we're experiencing, we're living day to day, that familiar story of the Tower of Babel, where everything was super productive until it wasn't and everyone spoke a different language. Collaboration is no longer possible when we don't speak a common language. So language shapes our work. And our work, of course, is part of our culture. Language is shaping our culture. And we feel it when the culture doesn't feel good, doesn't feel productive, doesn't fe it feels toxic sometimes, worst case scenario. Felt that before, toxic culture before. I have certainly felt it, doesn't feel good, sucks. And language shapes partnerships. Partnerships. I want you to put that in your back pocket because I think that's the most important word for me, for my career and my experience and what I see other teams experiencing, partnerships are so key. Um, so let's, let's find how to speak the language of good design. And here's our point of departure for today. Let's talk about the work. How, do, how should we be talking about our work more effectively? Even this phrase, the work, I studied painting in undergrad and graduate school, and we would always say, the work, not my work. You know the difference? It's to, it's to talk about something objectively instead of subjectively. So we talk about the work. We externalize that. So the first thing uh, I want you to think about is just visibility, the visibility of the work that you're, you're doing. Um, do people see your work? Are they aware of, of the types of projects that you're working on? This is often where a lot of uh, uh, people stumble. So when we visit companies, my team, uh, we visit lots of different types of companies, as I said. Um, it often looks something like this. And I, I love that there's, a, there's starting to be more publication around workspace and what leads to productive workspace. Um, does this look familiar to anyone? Computers out in the open, open office type of thing, right? Um, so this is great on so many levels. Like if when you interview and you go in and you see like there's some cool murals on the wall. It looks creative. There's, everyone's got these nice computers and so forth. Um, hold that image in your head. A couple years ago, I gave a lecture at Stanford in the D School, and it looked like this. It kind of looked like chaos, to be honest. It was a little bit crazy. Um, I'd heard about the D School a lot, um, and my colleague, Eli Woolery, teaches at the D School, and uh, so I knew a little bit about it, and I kind of had a picture in my mind of what that was going to look like. And I walked in, it was pretty crazy. There's stuff everywhere, all the furniture's on casters. There's a lot of things up on the walls, and these are movable boards. Um, what was interesting about this is when I think about these, these two spaces, they're so different. If you went to design school or you know, had this experience in college where there's a lot of debate and creative thinking, um, where there's language and conversation that's just inherent in, the, in the, the culture, that looks a lot different than where we go to work today. Where we work today is super polished and it has a message. I talked to uh, David Kelly about this. He's the co-founder of IDEO and uh, also uh, founded the D School. Um, he said, consciously or not, we feel and internalize what the space tells us about how to work. When you walk into most offices, the space tells you that it's meant for a group of people to work alone. Take a look at those people. They've got their headphones on. They are working alone. 
It's really hard to build partnerships and collaboration when this is the environment that we're building for, for ourselves. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not optimal. Um, so communication flows best when work is visible, and that's what I saw at the D School. I saw the work was out of computers. It was often physical. It was on the walls and spaces that we could interact with. I work in a totally remote company. We're distributed around uh, 28 countries around the world, 900 people. So we don't have a physical space to do something like this, but we make our own tools to help do this, and we, we find ways to, to make that work visible because it's so important. Because when people see the work, they can react to the work. They can ask questions. The debate happens. We can challenge one another. And just on a base level, there's awareness. This thing is happening, so if I spin up this project, it might be redundant of what's already happening. Or we could join forces. That sort of stuff reduces the chaos and creates collaboration. Um, and what I've also noticed with, with a lot of companies is that when design isn't visible, when it's locked in those spaces like that office we just saw a minute ago, when design's not visible, it's very hard for people to value it because they can't see it. I, if I can't see it, I can't understand it. If I can't understand it, I can't value it. If I can't value it, I can't invest in it. That's why you don't get the respect. That's why you, you don't uh, have the headcount that you want or the resources. That's why people think, oh, design is to make it pretty. It's because design is functioning in a black box and people don't understand it. There's a great book, not a coincidence, that comes out of the Stanford D School too. Uh, professors that I met there. Um, it's called Make Space. If you're interested in maybe, and you have the agency or control of your space in any way, shape, or form to try to make it more collaborative, this is basically a manual that will show you how to do it. Um, there, it's, it's, a, it's a really great reference. Okay, so um, making work visible is important, and part of that is how we do design reviews. So design reviews, um, are, are really the lifeblood of any design team. It's where you know, debate happens and that visibility of what's, what's going on with the project and status and so forth. There's a lot of pieces to it. I talked to Bob Baxley. He's a former Apple guy. He was um, at Apple and worked under Eddie Q with Steve Jobs on um, the, their, the store when the iPhone launched. And from his perspective, this is a very Apple-centric perspective, so Take it with a grain of salt. But from his perspective, he says, you know, forget everything else. Design reviews are the heart of any high-functioning design team. This is it. Like, if you're going to start in one place and, and level up your communication in your design team, this is where you do it. Um, and I, I would agree with that on, on many levels. Um, so one, one way that you can make your design reviews better is just think about who is included in those design reviews. Um, is it all designers? If so, then it probably feels like a comfortable conversation. Are there engineers there? Then maybe there's some challenge and pushback. Are there executives? Are there product people, marketing, sales, et cetera, experts that you need to, to work with directly? Inviting the right people, just like any good party, you gotta invite the right people to get the best results. And Coincidentally, Martini, who we, we saw on stage here yesterday, super sharp. Um, I've been talking to her a past, past couple years because I think she's super sharp about her approach. And she said uh, in her career, she's always made a point of inviting um, influential people in the company to her design reviews. So she's thinking specifically like there would be executives that are their key to the success of a project, that she would invite them into their design review. And she confessed to me, she said, I felt super scared. I felt like this is probably a bad idea. Um, this could totally go off the rails and the executive could see our work and think, this is terrible. Why are we investing in this design thing over here? Um, and more often than not, what happened was there was awareness, there was a good conversation, there was good debate. It was productive. So having the right people there is key. But I will say there's a point at which there's diminishing returns. Um, when you have too many people in a room, it's very hard to have productive conversations. Uh, I have called some meetings, some of the worst meetings I've ever run had like north of 12 people. 
and uh, it, it, you know, it just all goes off the rails. So if you can limit the number of people who are there, that's a really important piece. Five to six people, I'd say seven is like the, that's the line in the sand, no more. But you want diversity of thinking here. Um, it's not just designers who are gonna say like, yeah, that looks cool, looks so nice, I love the type. That's great and all, but that's really not gonna help us succeed. We want lots of different perspectives on the business, the customer, engineering, all the things that, that are required to make our best work. Um, now let me walk you through how to run a design review because uh, what you don't want to do is just say, like put some work on the wall and say, here's what I made, what do you think? Because you're probably not going to have a very productive outcome. So start by having a facilitator. If you're the designer, you're not the facilitator. Uh, the designer is there with listening ears, if the designer stands up and explains it, he or she robs everyone in the room of their fresh eyes. Those fresh eyes uh, are so key to seeing the work that you've been staring at so intimately for a long time, you can't see things so well after a while, right? Uh, so a facilitator will help set the stage and guide people in a productive conversation. Here's what that productive conversation looks like. I'm gonna crib directly from Google Ventures uh, they have put together a really lovely reference point. Um, if you look for, if you Google Medium, Google Ventures, Design Reviews, you'll find all these steps laid out for you. Here's what it looks like. You first set the stage, not, here's my work, what do you think? We say, thanks so much for coming to our design review today. Um, we're here because we're trying to achieve a specific goal. We're trying to improve the onboarding of our product. And our goal is to in, uh, in, increase the throughput in onboarding by 15% by the end of the quarter. And our customers have goals with this too. We've done some research, we've talked to customers and found out that they're kind of new to this marketing space and a lot of the language is confusing to them. And some of the things that we've had up front has confused them and turned them off and felt like, uh, made them feel like they couldn't use our product because it was too complicated. So we want to try to address those, those goals that our customers have. Now our constraints uh, for this project is, you know, there are lots of different places where onboarding happens inside the product, but we're just focusing on this one area because that fits into our time frame um, and for our, our goals here. And uh, our schedule, we've got to f be pencils down on the design by August 10th, so engineering has two weeks to complete that, we've got a week for QA, and then we ship. So we've got to work within the, that, that time constraint. Now, what we're gonna show you is pretty polished, but it's not all the way polished, so just know some things aren't fleshed out. Um, it, you're gonna see a prototype here. We're gonna use it on the device that our customers would use it on, so you can see that um, in a little bit higher fidelity. Uh, but know that there are a lot of things that are not fleshed out. And, uh, you know, so the feedback that we would like from you should tie back to these goals and keep in mind all these constraints we've just talked about. Got it? That framing changes everything. Because now you've got people that aren't using language like, I like this, or I think you should do this. It's tied back to what you're trying to achieve. They've got enough context to be productive and be supportive uh, to help you achieve your goals. Now, you can also direct that feedback specifically. If, you're, if you are in the room in a design review, if you're an engineer, and maybe you're, you've not been in a lot of design reviews, here's how to give feedback. And of course, if you're a designer and you are accustomed to it, maybe you've been doing, wrong, uh, doing it wrong, so let's, let's walk through this together. First, uh, you know, it's always nice to say, uh, to, to hear that, hey, this looks great, it looks really good. Um, you've been working hard and it looks great. But it's even better if someone can be candid and just say, you missed the mark in these places. So candid feedback um, is, is really important. And then specific, instead of saying like, you know, I think it would be better if, um, you know, uh, the language was just more clear. Okay, that's good, good to hear. Where is the language not clear? You can point out the specific place where we can make that improvement. And then, again, when you're given feedback, think about that goal. Our business goal is 
improvement in onboarding by the end of the quarter. If you can, tie that feedback back to that goal. You're going to hit that 15% mark if we can reduce the steps uh, a little bit more and just make this faster. You know, it's affirm what's working. These are things that are working. I see it. I recognize it as sort of like for the designer and facilitator to hear like, okay, these are, we acknowledge where, where we're doing okay. Um, that's important for us to see as well. Um, and then you want to, if you're, when you're giving feedback, try to point to problems before you jump into the solutioneering. Instead of, you should really do this. Have you thought of this? That's jumping into solutions, not speaking to problems. So speaking to problems first will make it more productive. Does this make sense? All right, great. Um, and in your feedback, it's always best um, to say you may instead of you must. Um, if you're an executive, if you're a person that's higher ranking, think about your feedback and how saying you should do this, that's a directive and that person is gonna do that exact thing. You, you're not actually sure if that's the right thing, right? So making suggestions and giving the designer the agency to be able to make decisions for herself is really key. All right. Let's talk about the polish of our work and the, you know, how we present that. Um, so I have found in my own experience, when I worked on a product design or some sort of design, and I polished it, like really thought about everything, super lined up, and then I show it to someone that I'm partnering with, an engineer, for example. When an engineer sees a perfectly polished comp, do you know what? She thinks, she thinks it's done. Now you just want me to build this, right? I'm not part of the process. From our perspective, we think I'm putting in my best effort. I'm working really hard to make sure I'm not missing any, any of the details. I want to show you that I am good at what I do. But in, in doing that, we accidentally communicate you're not part of this process. Um, now if you show someone a sketch that says something totally different. It's like, still figuring this out. What do you think? There's an open door, an open space for someone else, that engineer, to say, did you think about this? We could approach it in this way. And that creates more opportunity for partnership. So the fidelity or the polish of our work is really key in, in when we choose to present that. Um, I sat down with Jeff Tehan, who leads the design team that does the um, works on newsfeed for Facebook. And I was curious, like, how does Facebook do this stuff? Like, I would assume big company, lots of resources, big design team, they've got a super sophisticated technical design system. Like, I'll bet that they polish the heck out of anything that they do, and it goes high fidelity right away, and they move fast. And I was sitting down to try to figure out, like, how do they do that, so I could extract those insights and share that with other people. I found out something different from Jeff, so I'll let him tell you in his, his own words. In order for the design team to really have a voice and to, and, to, and to gain a really good reputation, it's not just about producing good work and, and impressing like the leads or the executives of a company. I think uh, having them presented, obviously, when we're doing reviews is important, but I also really think it's important for them to feel comfortable in showing work in progress. Because I think oftentimes in this industry, we really value the highly polished um, artifact, and that's what gets presented, and it's a very clean and polished story. Uh, and I think that that's great, but I think there should be room, and we should have a comfort as a design industry to share some stuff that's like not quite as thought through, um, even maybe at, the, at, at some higher levels, so that they can also have a part uh, in helping to shape it. So what Jeff says in the rest of this interview is that the, his team used to present these highly polished presentations to VPs, you know, executives, high-level folks. Um, and they decided to go out on a limb and show stuff that was not polished. And it turned out that the executives were way more engaged in the conversation when they saw the unpolished stuff. And it turned out that that conversation, that meeting every week, and Facebook has a lot of meetings, um, the executives reported that that was their favorite meeting that they had all week because 
there was a space for them to talk and, and like explore things together, to be part of that creative process. Retrospectives. Um, this is something, this is language that comes from Agile, um, but we can apply this in lots of different places, not just in, you know, Agile big A organizations. Basically, when we do things, um, it always makes sense to pause afterwards and reflect what did we do and how did we do, and was that productive? Is there, is there a way for us to do that better the next time? Um, people that do this, not just teams and companies, but people that do this sort of thing tend to grow faster. They learn faster. It's a, it's a great learning process, and it's a learning process together. Um, so retrospectives, um, as I said, it's, it's a way to learn from every success and failure, and it should be something that we build into our process all the time, no matter what we're doing, design, engineering, et cetera. Um, I talked to this guy, Matt Spiel. He was at Treehouse for a while, and now he's at Lyft, um, working on the design team there. And he has such a, a lucid, almost clever approach to retrospectives with his team. So uh, Matt, Matt told me, you know, retrospectives are a valuable tool to use because they help teams identify strengths and weaknesses, and they help provide an opportunity to get feedback on our process in order to grow and improve. Um, here's what, what Matt does. So he will um, schedule uh, a, a retrospective on a, a specific time, and he will send out a survey to everyone on his team who worked on that project and ask a few questions. And by the way, I, I do something very similar and have learned a lot from this. Um, so he asks questions like, um, you know, here's a Likert scale, rate the team's performance on this project on a scale of one to 10, for example, and individual performance. How did you do on this project? Um, expand that out. Uh, there are additional things that you can ask, like having open field uh, questions that you ask. And I don't think it has to be, uh, you know, follow a specific template or format. I ask broader questions like, did we have enough time for this project? Were the goals clear to you from the beginning and all along the way? Uh, did you get the stakeholder involvement and support that you needed along the way? These sorts of things, like the big things that, that push a project off the rails, right? Ask, did you get that? And you get a lot of you know, open feedback from people, and collating that to find the patterns is super useful. So the reason why asking that ahead of time is useful is because we start to reduce this groupthink bias um, where if we all came into the meeting and we said, how did it go? I think this went well. Yeah, that went well. I think this was messed up. Yeah, I think that too. And everyone sort of piles onto that. We start to build a shared perspective and we lose the details of our individual perspectives. And so doing the survey ahead of time really helps you capture the narrative there. What I do is I send the survey um, with a Google form, then I collate all of that in a Google Doc um, that has all the stuff, and then I go into the meeting, and I have that Google Doc, and I share the doc with everyone so they can see it. And stuff that's Likert scale, we can see the ranking. Stuff that's open, I've kind of curated and anonymized, so I'm not exposing anyone who might be, you know, saying something that's candid and maybe pointed at um, uh, one of the partners on the project. So learn a ton from this, and it helps refine your process. So Matt, Matt Spiel, uh, as part of his retrospective, they go through a start, stop, keep process. Have you done that before? Start, stop, keep? Heard of that? So next time, we'd like to start doing this based on what we learned. And we'd like to stop doing these things because that led to bad outcomes. And these things that worked well, we want to keep those. So it's a tidy way, easy to reference way to package up what you learned from that retrospective and communicate that out. What I do with the, that Google Doc then is I share it with the broader team, even with people who weren't involved in the project, because again, it, it brings visibility, and there are lessons to be learned from that project that it can, could inform other parts of, of the organization. All right, let's talk about infrastructure. Um, we learned about um, design operations, and we talked a little bit about Agile yesterday. I heard Kevin talk about that. Um, I see a lot of design teams uh, that there's reorganization that happens, and designers end up on what I call agile islands. 
And it's really a language problem because you get a designer that's, uh, you get ratios like this. One designer, 11 developers. Raise your hand if you are on an island. All right, so some of the strong reactions yesterday on Twitter about Agile, uh, if you are, have different views of Agile, this gives you some pers perspective. What does it feel like to be on an island? What does it feel like to be an expatriate, a stranger in a strange land? You're there, you know people, you're working with them, you've got rapport, but they kind of speak a different language than you. And you know that even if you start to adopt some of that language, you're still a stranger, you don't quite fit in. Your values are a little bit different. I think we should spend extra time on this animation because it creates a really great experience. And the value system of the 11 might say, you know, uh, that's just more lines of codes that, that I have to maintain. That takes an extra day um, in, in our process. And that's not optimal, we've got this deadline. So we'll cut that. So what happens is we start to, our values start to um, narrow and uh, our focus on what's important uh, it starts to narrow as well. So if you're on an agile island, um, it, it can be problematic. Um, so there's, there's an approach here called paired design. Just like engineers have paired programming, there's paired design. Um, I talked to uh, Diogenes Burrito at Slack. He's a, a designer and individual contributor there. And they have agile teams, they have cross-functional teams. When we think of Slack, we think of like, it's a company that just went public. It's raining money at Slack. Grass is greener over there, right? Turns out they have agile islands too, and they have problems. And they have designers who feel like, I'm not growing, I, you know, I get stuck on a problem and I can't get past it uh, because I'm the only designer on the team. I'm a stranger in a strange land. And so Dio's gonna tell you how they approach this to try to solve this problem. Here, the designers are assigned to groups in pairs, groups or teams in pairs. So there's always a lead designer um, who's the uh, point of contact for that particular project, but they're always working with another designer who's also assigned to that project. So, Making it official in that way means that, you know, it kind of it gives the other designer the ability to be like, this is one of my real projects, like it is in my set of priorities, I'm, I'm gonna devote real time to it, and I can, you know, I can say that to my team and they know that it's like part of the job, right? Um, but also, I think it helps when you're, uh, it helps avoid not being able to see the forest for the trees as like being the primary designer on a project because they have just a little bit of distance because they're working, um, you know, maybe not on that project as the primary designers, but they have all of the context around, you know, they've been working with that team on an ongoing basis. They understand, you know, for example, in the case of platform, they understand that you're working on this kind of tool for developers, they understand the constituencies of like an admin who needs to regulate apps in the company, a user who wants to install the apps, a developer who just wants to figure out what it can do and how to do it, that kind of thing. So it's really nice to be able to have that other person to just, to never be blocked for any long period of time to just kind of turn around and be like, what do you think of A versus B? And having that kind of collaboration be really low friction means that I think it, it just brings the quality of everything up. So that last bit kind of gives a certain impression where he said, you know, you can turn around and talk to a designer. That gives the impression that there's two designers on the team. So what I've heard from Dio and other people at Slack is that often it's one designer in a group of engineers, but they will schedule time with their, it's, it's a buddy system. So, you know, buddy A is working on this project, buddy B is working on that, and I'm, I know I'm gonna get stuck and so we schedule time to come together working on different projects to give one another feedback. Um, he also, there's an important point where he talked about like a lead, kind of alludes to a seniority. So if you are in a lead position, you can set this up where you've got someone who's a little bit more experienced with someone who's a little less experienced where they can pair and start to, coaching inevitably happens um, in, the, in that process. So I think it's a great solution because it's not something that requires lobbying for a reorg, um, additional headcount. It's really 
the sort of thing that you could bring to, you know, if you're an individual contributor, you could bring to your, uh, your manager and say, here's the thing that's going to help me do my work better, and it's going to build connective tissue in the company where, you know, this project team's going to know more about that project team, and that's good, right? That's a good thing. So it's an easy hack to, to try to address that uh, stranger in a strange land phenomenon. Design operations. Um, it, it is certainly a popular thing. About nine months ago, I Googled, uh, I didn't Google, I was on LinkedIn, and I looked for design ops in people's titles, and I found eight people, eight people. Today, it is a lot more than eight people. I don't know what the number is because it's changing, but I see design operations popping up in a lot of different types of, of organizations. Big insurance companies, have design operations. Media companies have design operations. Companies that are not very mature, that are trying to just like, they're level one, trying to figure stuff out, they're spinning up design operations functions. And it goes back to what I said at the beginning, is that all of it boils down to people problems. And when your team hits a certain scale, um, generally, you know, it's like north of 20, operations becomes really important. Based on that diagram I showed earlier, you know, you got 14 people, 91 lines of communication. Maybe 14 is a good, good point where you should, should start thinking about it. Um, so my team actually worked with some really interesting folks, people like Dave Maloof, who was uh, mentioned in Kevin's, Kevin's talk yesterday, Meredith Black, um, who is the former head of design ops uh, at Pinterest, and I would, I would categorize her as one of the foremost authorities on this topic, um, and uh, Kate Battles from Fitbit, um, and, and uh, Colin Whitehead from Dropbox. So we published, uh, to our knowledge, the first book on design ops. Um, it's the design ops handbook. You can find it at designbetter.com or .co. You'll get there either way. Um, while you're there, uh, you might want to check out the podcast, Design Better podcast, where Meredith Black talks about how design ops work, works. Um, she's super sharp and, and has a lot to share. So um, design operations, as we learned yesterday, is um, really a way for us to work more efficiently, to address a lot of the, the entropy that happens in our teams. Design operations happens on multiple levels. It could, be, it could start out where there's one design operations person, and that is a chief of staff, chief of staff to the, the design lead that helps operationalize all the things. And there's also something called a program manager, someone who is assigned to a project and pushes that through, helps clear the way and, and push that through. Um, so to help you understand design operations a little bit more, uh, I want to share with you a conversation I had with this guy, Josh Ohm, who used to be the uh, head of design at Oracle, but he recently just joined Wells Fargo. So he's in places where Design teams are relatively big, but they're not necessarily what we would categorize as design-driven companies. Um, and he is he just like has a super lucid view of, of how operations makes a team more efficient. I think it's incredibly important to have a operation function as part of the design team. So what I found is that um, as design is figuring out its process, it's often trying to mesh that into the rest of the product development process, usually mm -hmm. engineering. And engineering has a operations function that manages the process of the development, but oftentimes design doesn't mesh one-to-one -one with that process. Either they're a sprint ahead, or they're working in parallel, or the things they're working on, maybe the timing is different. What may take a sprint for engineering to develop will take design three sprints, or design can do something in one sprint, which engineering is gonna take three sprints. And so if design often relies on the development function to run the operations for the product development, um, oftentimes balls get dropped and the, the alignment isn't right. So um, I've learned early on to have a design operations function which specifically plans the way in which design will release its product back into the product development cycle. And so I build out these uh, operations organizations to do that. So I wanna make sure that my designers are designing and not worried about 
Is their computer working? Do they have the software they need? Do they know what they need to deliver? Have they delivered it on time? Who do they need to communicate with? How do they communicate with that person? How should they deliver? I want designers designing. And so operations are basically responsible for all the overhead that makes design happen. Um, and it usually fits into two camps. One camp is the, um, the HRE, human resource -y part of just we're a bunch of humans working together and designers are special. How do we make sure designers have what designers need? And then the other part of it is the how does design release its product over to mesh into another process, i.e. engineering and development. So then we've got program managers that are actually tracking the delivery of design and making sure that that process of our delivery meshes with the process of development coming in and figuring out how we align those deliveries together. Yeah. Um, so part of our exploration with that, that book, the Design Ops Handbook, um, we had a conversation with Colin Whitehead, co-author, uh, Dropbox guy. Um, and he had a, what I thought was a great, great label for part of what design operations offers to a, a design team, which is safe harbor. Um, basically, you know, um, protecting them from things like a swoop and poop. Experienced a swoop and poop before? <laughs> so if you can operationalize, you heard Josh allude to like driving communication. Things like design reviews, who's involved in that design review, at what time, et cetera and setting expectations ahead of time, like the email that goes out to the executives and other people about what's coming down the pipe. Um, you can effectively head off swoop and poops. Swoop and poops happen, uh, I should explain what that is. It's when you have a person of influence who comes in midway through a project without a whole lot of context and just says, oh, hey, that thing you're working on, we should really not do that, or we should do it in this totally different way and still ship it on August 15th. Good luck. Uh, I've, I've definitely experienced a few of those in my lifetime, and they suck. They really are not great. So design operations is a way um, can provide safe harbor. That communication that reduces entropy and gets everyone coordinating and lining, it also um, reduces the swoop and poop because again, that swoop happens when there's not enough context and they, you know, an executive either has a bright idea or thinks they're not doing it the way they should be doing. Um, that's when they start to inject that. Um, Colin, he said, you know, if a team knows when to expect feedback from specific people, whether from the CEO or from other stakeholders, they can tailor the presentation of their work to reflect how it addresses things like revenue goals, product goals, et cetera. So design operations can have a uh, person ha can have more awareness of what's on the mind of the rest of the business and make sure that uh, you know, that's, that's aligned well. Put the work in context. What's more, a design producer can set expectations and explain to stakeholders what type of feedback is needed at each particular stage in the design process. So valuable, so valuable. If you've, if you've been in a situation where that organization does, does not exist, and the work is sort of seen at ad hoc points, it just leads to a lot of confusion and chaos, and um, there's nothing that makes work less satisfying than, you know, it's like building a tower out of bricks, and someone comes by every two hours and kicks it down, and you have to build it back up. Um, there's only so many times you can do that, and then you just kind of throw up your hands and give up. So operations helps us address these pain points. Let's talk about the organization itself and how communication and leveling up our communication should work in this context. I find that a lot of design teams, the design teams that are most successful, know how to translate. So the teams that tend to be the most frustrated, these are some of the phrases I hear from them. People don't understand what we do. They just want me to make it pretty. They just bring me in at the end of the project after everything else has been decided and then they want me to you know, jazz it up. Or uh, you know, I'm never involved in strategy. Ever said that before? I know I have. Living your life as a victim is not a good experience. Doesn't feel good. The problem is that people can't really bring you into strategy if they don't see that you understand how the business operates. 
So you kind of have to have some business acumen and be able to translate, this is what design is doing, and here's where we're going as a business, and this is how design is influencing the business. If you can show people that you understand that, if you can connect the dots for people, you'll start to get invitations to those, those meetings that you want to be involved in. People will start thinking about your work in a different way. So when we talk about our work, it's great to talk amongst designers about kerning and typography and so forth, but let's put that to the side over here when we have conversations with engineers and executives and marketers and salespeople. Let's talk about what the business is trying to achieve. Let's talk about how design helps us get there. So we can talk about design debt. That sounds a little specific to, to our world. Um, that's going to make us slower. Uh, you know, slower time to market. With all of these things, like Dave showed us yesterday, hey, Papa John's, you've got 78 different button styles. When you want to make a new product, uh, you know, launch a, a new website or something, you're going to be slower to market, and Domino's is going to eat your lunch. Pun intended. Um, okay, if I'm an executive, I'm nodding my head like, yes, 78 buttons, not good. I want nine buttons. Fewer buttons is good, right? If you could talk about UX crashes, uh, this is actually something, the language that I heard from uh, a guy that I know at, at Spotify, who was talking to engineers and he was saying stuff like, hey, this is not high quality work. And they're like, what does that mean? I don't know what quality work means from a designer's perspective. And he changed his language, came back the next day. We have a UX crash. There's a UX crash with how the login is happening. It's so confusing. When people try to reset their password, they can't get in, and then they don't use our product. And we have these goals of trying to get X amount of usage from our, our customers. This is a UX crash. We got to fix that today. Roger that. I got it. OK, let's, let's work on that together. Um, we could talk about you know, UX crashes reducing retention. When you use language like that, people start to understand outside of the design team. So we need to start listening very carefully to hear how our colleagues and other teams talk. We need to listen carefully to the goals that you know, are mentioned in all hands meetings or any place that executives or, or people in charge are communicating uh, you know, what's, what's most important. And we also need to think carefully about how we measure our work. And this has been a really hard thing. I've been on the other side of the fence uh, uh, on this issue for some time where I thought as a designer, like, hey, what we do is inherently qualitative. I can tell you what customers say and you know, the perceptions that people have. And that's meaningful, but I often get the, the response that uh, yeah, it's a really small sample size. It's like two people that you heard from. So that's not big enough for us to act on. So we also need to speak the language of business through numbers and figure out ways to do that. Um, Laura mentioned the heart framework yesterday. This is one that people often reference. Um, I, I got a bit of the backstory. I had a conversation with uh, Carrie Rodden, who co-created the, the heart framework at Google a few years back. And she said, you know, people just kept coming to this research team that she ran, it was a quantitative research team, and saying, like, how do we measure our project? And she said, well, it kind of depends. What are you trying to achieve? And ultimately, some of these common things popped up, and that's why they created it. So heart is a reference point. It's like your starting stack of measurement. But it's not gospel. This is not the only thing you should measure. Things like retention is something that design can influence. Task success, that's something design can influence. Adoption and onboarding, we can influence that stuff. And it's easy for us to translate that language into business outcomes. When we have better retention, the business makes more money. We have more customers. Um, when you know, task success is high, we lower churn. Great, that's good. We keep our customers. Right? So we start to translate this in our mind, what we're doing. And it starts to shape our work, too, where we can think about this and, and make informed decisions about what we should be working on. So use this as a starting block, but don't use it as everything you should be measuring. Think about what your business really cares about. Listen for that. Uh, one hack is to go talk to your counterparts in engineering and say, what are your KPIs? What are you guys measuring? Um, 
and see if there's overlap in their goals and your goals, because if you can find a shared KPI, now you can really start to build partnership. Awareness. This is a, a short story, but I think it's a really important one. I've been talking to this guy, uh, Jihad Afaneh, and I'm probably butchering his last name. Um, I've been talking to him for the past couple years. He's at VMware. He's a very engineering-focused company. Um, he's attended something that, that we run, we co-run um, with a partner. It's called Design Leadership Camp, where we get leaders, like 30, 35 leaders from lots of different types of companies together to have honest conversations. And um, the first year that Jihad was there, uh, he was just trying to get the lights on on a design system. Um, and right now you see him wearing uh, you know, a t-shirt here, VMware Design, for a special conference that he ran internally. On the back is the logo for their design system. So uh, a year and a half ago, he was hoping, he was, he was approaching a cliff where he would run out of money and resources and the design system either it took off and people started using it or it went over the cliff and the project was shuttered. Well, the fast forward and, and it took off. Lots of people started using it and he told people, he went to everybody's stand-ups and said, here's this design system that we've got. And he, you know, just basically like got away from his desk and talked to a lot of people. Um, and he, he learned a lot from that experience and he said, I, you know, what I learned was that I'm not a design leader, I'm a business leader. And I think that's a really key way to frame our work is that we're business leaders in what we do. And so he has people reporting into him. He was an individual contributor, now he's head of design at VMware. That happened over a year and a half. And that happened from this translation. His career growth is probably the fastest I've seen in, in, uh, of most people in the industry. And I think it all comes back to this translation. Rethinking, I'm not a design leader, I'm a business leader. And so he has people reporting into him and they come in and they say like, here's this project we're working on. And he says, great, do executives know the name of the project? No. Have you made stickers? Have you made buttons? No. You're not done, get out of my office. I love that. Uh, He's basically reminding people that it's not enough just to do the work. We are doing work in the context of a large organization. We need to invest as much, probably more effort, in the marketing of our, our work inside of our organizations. Co-creation, getting multiple people involved in the process. Um, we've noticed in our studies of teams that design centricity in a company, it develops by initiating partnership in design. So design is sequestered over here, or design is bringing more people into the process. And when you bring people into the process, that's where a transformation begins. And we've noticed that sprints are a good, easy way to test that stuff out, because you can time box it to five days or three days, um, small chunks of time. In fact, there's a, a my team right now is working across the a larger part of our organization on a sprint right now as we, we speak. Um, and so here's uh, uh, Scott Yim from Northwestern Mutual. So here's a company that, again, we would probably put in the, the classification not design driven. Um, they're very old, I think they're over 100 years old. Um, so financial institution, and here's how they're using sprints to get in, more people engaged in the process. We did run into some obstacles, particularly with the design sprint. We've worked really hard to dispel the myth that you have to be a designer in order to contribute something valuable. The whole culture that, that I try to foster on the team is, hey, bad ideas um, are not a thing in this room. It's a safe space. And on the opposite end, the good ideas can come from anywhere, but also when we're sketching or we're you know putting brainstorming ideas out there, just making sure that everyone knows that you have something valuable to offer um, from your own discipline and that it's not expected that you can hop into Sketch or um, Photoshop or um, that you have this extensive background in design. It's just not necessary. And so we leave it pretty open, um, whether you can use words, you can sketch, you can draw boxes, whatever that is. Um, just get your ideas out on paper and there's always an opportunity afterwards to verbally share what you're doing and what your vision is. So I think it works best when we're able to get 
participation from all of the stakeholders and sometimes it ends up taking a bit more time for us. One really neat thing that we've done is we've actually flown out to some financial advisors offices across the country. They're such an invaluable part of our feedback process and our, our knowledge loop that getting them involved in a design sprint-esque kind of um, meeting or uh, day has been extremely valuable to us. So um, if, you're, if you're not familiar with sprints or if you're a skeptic of sprints and you know, sprints won't work in my large organization, um, we wrote a book about this um, with a guy named Richard Banfield um, who's been facilitating sprints for many years. Um, it's a free book at designbetter.com. Um, another thing we see is in addition to sprints is just internal workshops where teams are running workshops. Sometimes they call them a design thinking workshop or sometimes they just change the name uh, you know, to something that doesn't smack of design to make other people feel welcome. And this is something we see happening in a lot of companies. Um, you know, Northwestern Mutual, the Home Depot, we see them doing this, Nationwide Insurance, IBM, Cisco. This workshopping thing um, is, is a, uh, a way for design to change from like this insulated group of magic to open the doors and they start to build this input-output layer of design being infused in the rest of the organization. Abigail Hart Gray, who's at Google, she actually used to be Scott Yim's uh, boss at Northwestern Mutual. Um, she talked about how she's been using workshops. She said that you know, workshops are good for getting people's buy-in, and if they're part of the process, you're also making use of that valuable knowledge that's stuck in their heads, which designers may not know. So I think there's a lot of assumptions that we make as designers that we kind of understand everything that needs to happen for our customers. We, we think of ourselves as holding the flag of the customer and we're empathetic. Um, but there are a lot of our colleagues who have strong understanding of those problems as well and bring perspectives we don't have. So this workshopping process, running a design thinking workshop or a sprint is a way to bring that in and in the process help people see that this is what design is. This feels like strategy to me. It doesn't feel like you know, we're pushing pixels around. We're thinking about a problem together. And that starts to change hearts and minds. And there is another thing that happens uh, in that process of workshopping and sprinting and doing things together, co-creating, is that we start to create a shared language, a shared language and a shared process. The Home Depot saw that engineers who had been part of their sprints started to use processes like Crazy 8s without any designers around. They were doing that back in the little engineering area of the Home Depot. Um, so creating that shared language where we can talk about this stuff together and have common ground is key. And that brings us full circle. That language, creating a shared language, is so important. It's important for us to do our best work. Um, it fuels a, a culture of feedback where we get the feedback that, that we need to do uh, more informed work, create better products and experiences for our customers. Ideally, it's supported by infrastructure like design operations and um, other things that protect the swoop and poop and, and help us focus and, and align with other teams. And language, really key, helps designers, helps us all have a shared language that aligns back to the business. What's the business trying to achieve? And if we can point in that same direction, that's our beacon on the hill, that's how we move together. You remember at the beginning I said, I want you to put this in your back pocket, that partnerships is the most important word. This is where I got, got it wrong in my career. This is where I totally screwed it up, where I said me instead of we. Um, early in my career where I thought I had it all figured out, that I understood the customer and that I could make the, the best product with the design team. And it was only through the school of hard knocks that I learned that I actually don't know everything. I'm not as smart as I think I am. And there are a lot of other smart people that have different perspectives that conflict with mine. And I need to hear those things. I need to hear those to broaden my understanding and to grow. 
and I only get those, part, those, those, those perspectives when I actively build partnerships um, and I invest in other people. I share that with you because I hope that you don't have to go through that same school of hard knocks in your career. I hope that you can find a way to build partnerships and use language to, to do your best work. Thank you so much.